Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Ken Nash. I'm so glad to see you here, and those of you tuning in online as well at our 84th Street campus. A really wonderful day. A really nerve-wracking series we're calling this Worth the Risk. Last week, we looked at the, the fact that it's worth the risk to follow Jesus with your life. Greatest decision you will ever make is to take that step of faith and say, I'm going to walk by faith following Jesus with my life. Today and the next two weeks after this, so these next three weeks, I'm a little sweaty palmed about talking about them, even starting with today. Because the whole idea of really being worth the risk, today we're actually looking at the worth the risk to be vulnerable. That's a hard concept. Like, I can't be vulnerable. I have to keep, I have to keep my walls up. And, and so that's kind of tough. Steve Place, he's uh, one of our uh, real, uh, he's been a friend of mine for 25 years, phenomenal man of God. He, he's in our Cornerstone Connection, actually works on our writing team, does a lot of work uh, with, he's a uh, pastor of Faith uh, Community Church uh, north of here. Great partnership that we have. He had a terrible stat the other day. His stat said this, and he, ba- he fact-checked it all the way through. The average person lies four times every day. I'm like, no way. And then it dawned on me, yeah, I lied yesterday. (laughs) I did. We had some internet issues, and so I I called, and they had to do this stuff, and it said, I have read and agree to the terms of this (laughs) condition. (laughs) I checked it. I didn't read one word. Uh, Liar! There's one of my lies. There's a second lie that frequently comes up, and I, I would dare say this lie is at the top. I'm fine. I'm fine. It, it really is somewhat of our, of our tension. Uh, Simone Biles uh, just won uh, three golds and a bronze and uh, has 11 Olympic medals. Uh, in 2020, she got what was known as the twisties, where her body and the psychology and the, the physiology all was messed up, and she really she couldn't keep competing in the Olympics. It made a very, very big deal. And, uh, and so she, though, has come out of that. And this week, she posted a phrase, it's okay to not be okay. She put this out loud and proud. She said, it's okay to not be okay in life. And it's true. I actually, I agree with that phrase. It's okay to not be okay. It makes sense. Uh, The the tension, though, with that is that as we wear masks, it's okay to not be okay. Like, does that mean, like if some, let's say you're walking into Meijer and the greeter says, hey, how you doing? I don't know if that means I need to stop there and say, well, let me tell you, because I don't want to lie to you. And you just lay it all out with the, with the Meyer greeter. That's probably not the appropriate place. And so this idea of it's okay to not be okay, it makes a lot of sense. And I agree with it fully. I like that our culture is learning how to talk about the problems going on within us. I think that's very healthy and good. I, I believe what this is getting at is the, what Jesus talked about in Luke 12. And I want to read this from the message translation. Then we'll hang out in the NIV for the rest as I uh, open my Bible here. But Luke 12. Jesus said this, and I love the way it's worded here in the message translation. You can't keep your true self hidden forever. You can't keep your true self hidden forever. Before long, you'll be exposed. You can't hide behind a religious mask forever. Sooner or later, the mask will slip and your true face will be known. Jesus is saying clearly, you're going you're gonna to be known You're going to be found out. I am convinced we are as healthy as the deepest secret we have buried. Or we are as healthy as the amount of masks we wear. The more we hide, the more we actually fall into, I'm not okay. And we can say, how did I get here? How did I end up so messed up? Well, it's possible that you kind of the Luke 12, you were kind of burying all of it all. I've shared this quote before. I used to do um, prison min- or jail ministry at Ottawa County Jail when I was in college and many, many years ago. And uh, a man that I met with one night had, um, was in for murder. And I said, can, can I, as we got close in conversation, he kind of opened up to me and he said, can I, I'll, I'll just say it this way. I buried my anger and when it finally came out, it buried me. You're only as healthy as the deepest stuff that you bury away. And he had, he's going to be in prison the rest of his life. 
And it all happened because he, he buried something so deeply, he wasn't willing to face it. This Luke 12 passage I just read from Jesus, these words are so prominent for our life today that I'm willing, I, it seems what Jesus is saying is, why not start the cleansing process right now? Eventually, you'll be known. You'll be fully known. It'll, it'll all be exposed. The Apostle Paul in another passage, he says, life in eternity. And a few weeks ago, Mandy took us through heaven and what heaven's going to be like. And Paul talks about heaven this way. It's like a mirror that has a fog on it and you get a chance to wipe that fog away. Eternity is filled with revelation of, if only I had dealt with that then. What Jesus is trying to say to us here in that Luke passage I just read, he's saying, deal with it now. Start the cleansing process now. So the question you may have is, okay, how? I, I, I would like to be vulnerable. I would like to open up. But I, it's, it's hard for me. I'm going to take you through three passages that deal with the it's okay to not be okay concept. But it's actually these three passages we're going to look at right now actually say it even more aggressively. And here's how it really starts. They say it this way. It's not okay to not be okay it's not okay to not be okay, dot, 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 alone. I will agree all day long, it's okay to not be okay. I like it when people say, I'm not okay. If I say, how are you doing today? And they say, I'm not okay. I love when people have the courage to be vulnerable and say, I'm really struggling with, and fill in the blank. But it's not okay to not be okay alone, ever. And the three passages we're about to read are going to be in our face aggressively showing us that truth. Because it's true. It's not okay to not be okay alone, ever. Passage number one. And you'll see the intensity of what I mean as you look. We're just going to hang out in Hebrews and the book of James. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Listen to this. Let us consider... How we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Look at this language here. I mean, basically what Hebrews 10 here is saying, it's a summary. It's not okay to not be okay alone. The Hebrew writer is so clear. Stop thinking you're supposed to do life alone. He, he's writing, there's many people who are trying to do it alone. And they're not meeting together with other believers. And they're struggling and they're in so much trouble. I mean, look at the verbs in this. Consider and spur one another and don't give up meeting and encourage one another. I mean, it's loaded with in-your-face aggressive work. But you may say what I've heard many people say and what I've even said. But people hurt me. I've been so wounded by other people, I don't want to open up again because the last time I opened up, they wounded me with it. I can't really disagree with that. I thought becoming a pastor 30 years ago when I was kind of wide-eyed, bushy-tailed, excited, like, yeah, I can't wait for all this. I was so excited about the future and stuff, but I didn't realize that when you care for sheep, sheep sometimes bite. <laughs> they kind of do. And so I get it. And there was a season back in my, in my early days and even in more recent years where I'm like, ah, oh, man, I, I just don't feel safe right now. I don't feel like I can really get vulnerable and share this because it's so hard because people hurt. And there, there's some really complicated things. But again, as you see what the Hebrew writer is saying, just consider the idea. Consider the idea of meeting with other people. Don't neglect gathering with others and encourage one another because he's talking about the day of judgment, but tough days are coming. And so when you face the challenges of life, yeah, people are going to bite. 
People are going to hurt sometimes, but consider moving together with others. It's not okay to not be okay alone. It's really what he's saying so clearly. I have a working hypothesis right now that this idea of being vulnerable and opening your heart and life with other people, it's, it's almost like, you know how the frustration of, have you ever exercised a lot and you're like, oh, I'm in the best shape of my life. And then you say, I'm gonna take a break. And then like a week or two goes by and you're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I can barely move. Like it's, it's so discouraging because it feels like everything, you, life feels like you're just climbing up a hill. I mean, I talked about that back in June when I was talking about turning 50 and I'm like, oh, I feel like life is climbing and it's climb, climb, climb. And if you rest for a minute, sometimes it feels like you topple all the way back down and you're back at square one. Working with people and the challenges of that, that's what the Hebrew writer here is saying. Consider, this is hard work, but it's worth it to our point of this series. It's worth the risk to keep gathering together and encouraging one another and spurring one another on when you care for one another in this way. But I'm going to agree with what it seems here. These are decisions you have to make. So it's hard work. It's hard work to keep getting healthier and healthier. All that makes sense to me. But my working hypothesis is is this. When we go through a season where we're just tired, I've been hurt by somebody and I I don't want to put, so I put my wall up. We start to put walls up and all the while we're putting walls up, we think we're protecting ourselves But what we're actually doing is keeping, and and we're hoping somebody will love us enough to come around that wall or will love us enough to keep busting that wall down. But those walls actually push people away and they say, well, she doesn't want to meet with me. He doesn't want to meet with me. And so they feel rejected. So it's almost my working hypothesis is we do the damage to ourselves and we spiral out of control because the walls we put up that we think will make us feel safe actually isolate us and it pushes people away and we spiral further and further away from being encouraged, spurring one another on, meeting together and feeling safe. It makes sense because we, we've been hurt. We, and so we push each other away all because we're afraid that if I open up again, you're going to hurt me like you did last time. That leads to scripture number two. We've already looked at the first one. I'm going to go over to and go back to chapter three, verse 12. Another set of passages here. Listen to this. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. See to it brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But, here's that word that we saw seven chapters later, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So be careful that you don't turn away from God. There's two observations about turning away from God. And again, kind of the walls that we put up. Because sometimes when we put walls up, it's against other people. But it also can be against God. It's like God wants to shower blessings. But it's like we're walking around with an umbrella saying, I don't want to receive the showering of blessings because I'm afraid of everybody and even afraid of God. And this, again, the Hebrew writer is saying in chapter 3, be careful to not turn away. There's two observations about turning away from God that really kind of spur my heart. The first one, he says, encourage daily. You've heard me say, if you've ever been to Cornerstone, I say this a lot because I've been so impacted by different people who have been through brokenness. I'm deeply attracted to people who have been through a time of brokenness and then they come out on the other side healed. AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, has very much impressed me through just some of the people I've met who have gone through that program and and, and other programs like it. But um, I'll never forget, many years ago, a friend of mine that I had met started to build a relationship with. He said, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. And I've been an alcoholic for uh, for a long time, but I, I haven't had a drink for 30 years. 
And I, the first time I heard that, I scratched my head and I thought, <laughs> 30 years, I, at what point can you say I'm no longer an alcoholic? And he was wise enough to say, I'm only one drink away from being an alcoholic again. So I'm only as strong as today. And that's what the Hebrew writer here is saying so beautifully. Encourage one another daily while today is called to today. And so it's, a, it's an idea of saying, I'm only as healthy and vulnerable as I am willing to open my life today. I can't control the past and my regrets from the past, and I certainly can't change the future, but I can change my future by choosing today to encourage you and to receive encouragement from you. But if I've been wounded by you and I put a wall up and I push you away, I'm going to be in dangerous territory of being turned away from God by the second concept here, sin's deceitfulness. You realize that we, we've, we've talked about this before, like we have an enemy of God called the devil, Satan, like he, he hates us. But do you realize that the, I, I don't think we get attacked frequently by, by the devil himself. I think sin itself. I mean, that's what the Hebrew writer here is saying. And in Numbers, it says, be careful that your sin will find you out. Like sin, when you decide to do things that are contrary to God's ways, that sin almost becomes personified and becomes like alive and it attacks you. Your decisions can sabotage your future. Sin has a way of isolating you and making you feel trapped. I'll come at it this way. Uh, 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 this, um, and I think I've shared this illustration before. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I don't, but let me finish my thought. <laughs> but zebras, I heard this years ago, zebras have stripes to protect them from predators. Lions have eyes that are what's called perivisual, meaning they're much different eyes than our eyes. They can't distinguish individuals. So when the zebras, if you ever notice on the Serengeti or whatever, we've done trips to Kenya as a church. We do mission in Kenya, and so we've done some trips where we actually get to see these. And you can always see zebras together. And they're, when they're together, all the, all the stripes bleed together. And so a lion sits there, and their eyes look at them, and they go, that's one big zebra. I ain't going to attack that sucker. That thing, it will destroy me. It's huge. But then you get one zebra who's isolated by themselves and they go off by themselves. That's when they're in danger. And that's what I'm reading here in this passage. It's like that zebra by itself is in grave danger. And so that's what the Hebrew writer is saying again to us, saying, don't turn away from God and be deceived by your sin. Your sin will start to talk to you. You know what it will say to you? It'll say, don't ever talk about me. Because if you tell them about me, they will shame you and you will be humiliated by the behavior of your life. Sin lies to us. Sin says you can never be forgiven. Sin tells you you don't have any hope. Sin tells you you're a failure. And so you isolate yourself. And that's why, again, the Hebrew writer is saying so clearly, do not neglect meeting together. You have to share your life, just like what Jesus said, what we talked about in the beginning. Share it now. You might as well start the healing process now. But you think, if I do, I'm in trouble. I'm going to be... I'm going to be gossiped about and people are going to put me down and I, I'm going to, you're going to be filled with shame. Let's just call it what it is. So you have all of this stuff inside of you and so you isolate yourself and sin just continues to lie. And that's why, again, the writer here is telling us clearly, meet together, encourage one another, spur one another on every day. Don't put that wall up because the minute you put that wall up, you isolate yourself and you will be attacked. And when you're alone, you're most vulnerable. You're most in danger. So what I'm hearing loud and clear today is be vulnerable with others. It's okay to not be okay. 
I hope you hear that at Cornerstone. If you've been here any amount of time, that's why we push counseling and mental health issues and and support groups and, and small groups and connecting together because when we do life together and we're open and honest with one another, that is when we're safest and most protected. But when you isolate yourself and say, if you ever found out about fill in the blank, I, 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 I don't know what I would do. I learned this lesson uh, early on in my marriage. We were, I was actually pastoring at a, a church in Carson City, north of here, right in the middle of the state. And um, I was in a men's group, and we had one night where we were just so vulnerable. It all came out. We were just sharing so many thoughts. And I was five, six, maybe seven years into marriage. And I was feeling my heart racing as I was hearing these guys share some of the, the struggles of their life. And they were confessing sin and sharing what was going on in their life. And I, and I heard an audible voice in my spirit. It was audible to my spirit. It wasn't like out loud. My ears couldn't hear it. But my spirit clearly knew it was from God. Tell Christine. My wife, tell your wife. And I, and, and I was like, no way. She, 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 no, I can't tell her that. There's no way. And I just kept hearing, just tell her, tell her, tell her. And then he gets annoying. Tell her, tell her, tell her. I'm like, no. And as the guys were sharing, I just felt so safe. I shared it with them and they said, hey, you should tell Christine that. And I was like... <laughs> I'll never forget. I'm, I'm in my 20s trying to figure out life. I don't know which way is up or down. I you know, feel shame and all that. And I, I go home and I sit down on the couch. I'll never forget. As vivid as, as talking to you right now. And I sit on the couch and I say, hey, I got to tell you something. And I couldn't get it out. It was, took half an hour to finally say, I got to tell you something. And it was so awkward and it was all crazy. And, and then I just shared with her. And, and she said, thanks for telling me. I was like, wait a minute. I thought you'd get a knife. Where's the knife? I had a Dateline episode in my head. I was ready for death for the night. Like, this is it. This is the end of me, the end of us. This is terrible. And she said, thank you for sharing that with me. And I learned a huge lesson that day. It kind of goes back to those cartoons that we watched as kids. If you ever saw like that little, you ever see a big shadow coming at you and like there's somebody scared, it's a big shadow. And then you actually see it's a mouse with a light coming from this angle and it's just big shadow. We build up such things in the darkness. I mean, there, there's a reason moss and, and um, different kinds of diseases grow in the darkness because they, they flourish in the dark. But what does the light do? The light destroys anything that is evil. And so you bring it out into the light and you just walk in freedom. You, I mean, I, I couldn't believe the freedom that I felt just by sharing it. And I was like, I can be vulnerable. I can be honest with my struggles. I can be honest with my fears. I can be honest with the things that I've stumbled into. And the more honest you are, the more vulnerable you are, the more freedom you get. And that kind of leads to the healing process. That's the third concept we're going to look at here. So I hope you've heard clearly from in Hebrews, encourage one another, spur one another on. Don't stop meeting with other people. It's okay to not be okay but it's not okay to not be okay alone. So gather with other people. So clear. So the question is, okay, how, how, how do I deal with this? Where does the healing come from? Well, it comes from the gathering and then this. I'm going to flip over just one book of the Bible to James, James 5.16. I guess I'll ask you this question. How is sin healed according to Scripture? How is sin healed? Now, the Sunday school answer is Jesus. And I know that answer, and that answer is true. Jesus heals us of sin. When he walked out of the grave, he brought a full healing, the power of the Holy Spirit. He took sin and destroyed it and sent it back to hell where it belongs. That's beautiful. What a gift. But how is it healed practically in life? James 5, 16 says it. Confess your sins... To Jesus. No, it doesn't say that. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, of course, Jesus does save, but when you can, I have found when I confess to Jesus, but I don't share it with anybody else, there's no accountability held. 
And there's power in community that happens spiritually that I think some of us don't realize. I've shared this illustration before because I love it so much and I frankly think about this illustration probably once a week, if not more. It's the idea of if I'm walking along and I stub my toe, boom, oh, have you ever hit your toe like on the edge of the bed or something, some table leg, and it's like, like you would rather die than have to try to go through any more pain. It's so much pain. You're like, help me, what just happened? And like everything in that moment, think about what your body is doing when you have a broken toe or a toe that's just starting to blow up and you're like, ah, many things happen. Your body becomes the body. And here's what, it hap- here's what happens. Your body in that moment will scream with synapses, axons, neurons that shoot all these messages up to the brain. And the brain kicks in and does really two things. It will take your one hand, grab the toe, it's in pain, and you'll grab it, wham, like that. And then it'll say, cover your mouth with the other one so you don't swear. <laughs> and you look like this, right? <laughs> your body does what the body has to do to heal itself. That's what James 5 is saying here. Confess your sin to one another. So if I confess sin to you, my hope is that you don't go, you're a pastor. My hope is that you say, let me pray for you. And my hope is that you jump in and you say, let me help you. And now you become the synapse, the axon, the neuron. And you send, the prayer. what did it say? The prayers of a righteous person are effective. What does that mean? It means when I confess to you, And I'm saying, I'm struggling with this issue or I am so broken, I don't know how to handle it. I wanna just punch something, I'm so hurt or I can't believe what I did. Whatever it is that I share, my hope is that then you would, Heavenly Father, I'm praying on behalf of my brother Ken and I'm lifting him up in prayer and right then you are sending a signal to heaven. You're sending a signal on my behalf because I can't pray, I'm just trying not to swear. I'm hurting. I'm in so much pain right now. And you're praying on my behalf. You send your prayers to the Heavenly Father on my behalf. And the Heavenly Father then, through the Spirit, touches me and connects with me. And now I've got accountability and care. You become Jesus with skin on to me. You become tangible evidence of God that God is going to heal me through you. That's what I've experienced countless times in my faith journey thus far. And that's what I'm asking for those of you who haven't taken this step to be vulnerable. I'm telling you, it's worth the risk. John Ortberg has a, has a great quote. Um, he says this, the irony of masks is that although we wear them to make other people think well of us, they are drawn to us only when we take them off. Although we wear them to make other people think well of us, they are only drawn to us when we take them off. So I put a mask on so that you like me. But what he's saying is exactly what the scriptures are saying. But you're actually more drawn to me the more I take the mask off and I'm vulnerable with you. And the more open and honest I am with you, that's where the healing happens. That's a beautiful gift. That's what Genesis 1 was teaching us from the beginning. We were created for this. God made us to be in community with one another. And he says, with Adam and Eve, he says, I want you to, you are naked and unashamed. And we always kind of chuckle like we're middle schoolers. Ha ha ha, they're naked and unashamed. That actually is not a sexual term. It's actually a vulnerable term. They were, another way to translate it, they were fully known. They fully understood each other. That's what it's supposed to be like. That's what community of faith is supposed to be like, where we protect one another, care for one another, and say, you can take your masks off and be vulnerable with me. I will pray for you. I will give you advice. I will listen to you. I will cry with you. I am safe. That's what I'm, I'm praying we continue to pursue as a church, that we can create safe space to be vulnerable with each other. But again, I know it's risky, but I'm telling you, it's worth the risk. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to not be okay alone. 
Never be okay, never not be okay alone. Like the, this is essential to our health and our vitality. So my question before you right now is, you may be saying, okay, so how, how do I get vulnerable? How do I share all of this? I, I can't just start telling people. Well, this is why we say take the risk. I'm, I'm inviting you to just consider this. Going back to the Hebrews passage, consider how to encourage each other, how to spur one another on. Consider these ideas. Right after this service, uh, Barb Fay, Pastor Barb Fay, is uh, the head of our small groups here. She'll be right out at the guest services desk right out here, and you can just let her know, I want to be in a small group. My wife and I have been in small groups virtually our entire married life. Uh, The the last several years have been hard with Mason. We have a child with special needs. It's a little tougher to get to our schedules because it's hard to raise him, but, but we have community for that and some care. And so we have found that we have smaller small groups than we've had in the past. I have four or five guys that literally know everything about me. They, they're just safe. I can just say, hey, I'm struggling with this. And they literally, so, so many times I've been rescued because when I get that poison out, it's, I can't tell you how free it is when I can share something and get it out and they just say, I'm praying with you and let's figure this out together. They don't just say, hey, good luck with that. You know, years ago, I, I, I've done this many times. I throw up a trust balloon, so I'll give you a little bit of information. And if you say, how dare you? I'm like, pop. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That was, no, I'm just joking. And then I walk away and don't really I'll get vulnerable again. I'm not saying be vulnerable with everybody. My wife has this one person that when, 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 I, when she's with her, she's her prayer warrior to the nth degree. I know when they're together, I'm like, the next week is going to be fantastic around this house. <laughs> because there is power in community. She can be so vulnerable. And so open and honest. And, and so in the small groups, this is what's so beautiful about it. The small groups we've been in through the years in different sizes. We, we have many, do, several dozens around Cornerstone that every time I see any of these people, uh, literally, I could go 10 years and not see some of them because we're not meeting actively in those groups anymore. I'm like, the minute I see them, my heart just feels safe because we've been through some trenches together because we've been open and honest You may think right now, well, I'm in a small group and we're not vulnerable. Well, okay, that tells me you're all wearing masks. How do you get vulnerable with a group? One of you needs to have the courage to take the mask off and start saying, did you hear the sermon on Sunday? I'm going to tell you some junk tonight. John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist movement for the past 250 years, he, he said something brilliant about small groups. He said, in small groups, we hold each other accountable to being good you know, workers, uh, walk in good morality, make good decisions, um, good care for family, all that stuff. But the final question we ask at the end of all of our small groups is this. Have you lied about any of your answers tonight? And he said, that's when the real small group begins. Because we get vulnerable. It takes only one of you to change the culture of your group. I love to preach over at our Heritage Hill campus. There's a whole bunch of guys that have been set free through their their brokenness. They meet like an AA style. And um, they are so vulnerable. And anytime they show up at a study or whatever, they just say, I'm messed up. Anybody else? And everybody else takes their mask off and say, it's safe. I I can be me here. And they set it aside. Again, I know what I'm talking about is not easy to consider, but that's why we started with that. Consider this idea, because if your world feels a little bit trapped and isolated and you feel like I'm that zebra all by myself, and nobody, if you've ever said, nobody understands, it starts with you courageously going to somebody that you feel a little bit safe with and saying, hey, I feel, I feel somewhat safe with you, can I share some things with you? And then share a little bit with them and see what happens. And if they are safe, take it a little bit further and a little bit further to the point where, again, you're only as healthy as your deepest hidden sin. So just share. It is the path to freedom. It is where healing is found. This, there's a song. This is where the healing begins. When you have the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through you, courageously sharing with another person, you now have somebody who can be physical, tangible connection with God together. And so I lay this before you as a challenge. Another way to ask it, who is your person? 
Who is your person? Go up to that person and say, you are my person. And I need time with you because you have created safety for me and I need to share some really painful thoughts in my heart and mind right now. It's worth the risk to be vulnerable. This is the point to the church. But I will be the first to admit, we as the church, the capital C historical church, we have failed in this department. We have put on our religious masks and we have, we have failed you and, and I'm so sorry. But as far as we can control an environment with our, with our little church, our little local church called Cornerstone, we're going after this and we want to help in any way that we can. So we thought today the very best way to start the tangible process of healing uh, is through the, the uh, sacrament of, of communion. And uh, this is a chance to commune. Think about that word. We are in community with each other. So I'm going to invite the band to come out and we're going to sing a, a couple of songs here together. And as we do, we're going to experience the table of the Lord. This is what Jesus intended is to be vulnerable with each other. He said, I want you to meet together and I want you to, to feast together, to share with one another, to do life together, to be honest and open and vulnerable because it's not okay to not be okay alone. It's not okay to not be okay by yourself. So we thought, let's, let's spend some time with Jesus who, who intentionally, physically wants to connect with us through the bread and the juice and wants to then connect with us spiritually. If you're a guest with us, it's an open table. This is, we, we believe by the grace of the Lord Jesus, all are welcome at the table of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just ask that you desire to seek him. Like we said last week, I want to take the risk to follow Jesus with my life and to come and take of it. And so you'll come and take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. I'll invite the communion servants to come out. We'll have some servants that will be here to serve. We have stations in the back, stations in the front. The ushers will come and dismiss you by row. And we'll have some time where we just can be vulnerable with Jesus first. So as you come to the table, may it be a moment where you say, Jesus, I'm hurting. Or Jesus, I have sinned and I'm asking for forgiveness. Jesus, I'm asking for your healing. Jesus, I'm, I'm struggling with, and just share it with him. And in that process of being vulnerable with Jesus, I'm willing to bet, and my prayer will be that the Holy Spirit through Christ will, will give you a name of somebody that you could talk to with skin on. Somebody that can be there for you. You can be vulnerable with. There's some gluten-free station as well. As well, you can just take one of those packages, and those uh, will. Uh, um, you'll see the sign there as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this heavy, heavy, heavy challenge set before us today. I know there's a lot of wounds in this place. I have been wounded by people so many times, and God help me to keep taking, tearing those walls down in the power of your, your Holy Spirit. And I ask that you will uh, continue to help us to find those safe people that we can open up to. Maybe some will talk with Pastor Barb today and get into a small group and, and be connected that way, officially through Cornerstone. But God, help us all to be connected to each other and connected to you. I ask for your Holy Spirit to fill us to overflowing and uh, convict us where we need to be convicted in the sin that has been so easily entangling us and for those wounds that have isolated us. I pray, God, for just a reconnection and a sense of being vulnerable and safe with one another. I thank you for the gift of the body of Christ. And I pray these elements will be for us, the body and the blood of Christ in the spiritual sense that we'll connect with you and be vulnerable with you first, Lord, and that you will guide us to the care of the church family as we walk through these tough days together. In Jesus' name we pray this anointing. Amen.